Ariel succumbed to her wounds after being stabbed by a terrorist who broke into her home and stabbed her repeatedly in the head as she slept. IDF observation posts spotted the terrorists climbing the fence and alerted the community's emergency response team. The armed civilians broke into the house and shot the 17-year-old Palestinian terrorist dead after he stabbed the 31-year-old member of the response team and began to flee from the house towards a nearby yeshiva. During the shootout, the 31-year-old response team member was also hit by bullets and seriously injured. He was taken to Hadassah Hospital in Enkaram. Doctors later upgraded his condition, saying he was stable. Magen David Adom emergency teams dispatched Ariel to Sharet Tzedek Hospital, where doctors were forced to pronounce her dead. Residents of the Givat HaSena neighborhood were instructed to remain in their homes until soldiers completed scouring the area to determine whether other terrorists had infiltrated the community. The 17-year-old Palestinian terrorist was named as Mohammed Tarayra from the village of Bani Naim near Hebron. He recently wrote on his Facebook page about his plan to die. Following the attack, IDF forces were deployed to the Palestinian village where they conducted searches and questioned locals. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said, The horrifying murder of an innocent child in her bed sheds light on the bloodlust and lack of humanity displayed by the terrorists, calling on enlightened nations to put a stop to Palestinian incitement. Nine left-wing Israeli activists who entered Ramallah last night to take part in a Ramadan iftar dinner were attacked with rocks and firebombs. No one was injured, but damage was caused to one of their vehicles. Eight of the Israelis, all members of the two states' one homeland peace group, succeeded in leaving the West Bank city and returned to Israel safely. One handed himself over to Palestinian intelligence officials who transferred him to the IDF. The nine were questioned by Israeli authorities for violating a standing military order barring Israelis from entering Area A, which is under Palestinian control. They said they plan to meet a Palestinian journalist who is a fellow member of their group for the fast-breaking dinner. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has instructed Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit to examine ways of expelling member of Knesset Hanin Zoabi of the joint list from the Knesset. This after the Arab MK called the Israeli commanders who participated in the 2010 raid on the Mavi Marmara murderers during a heated debate in the plenum. Her words caused outrage with fellow lawmakers who took to the podium demanding her removal and insisting she apologize. Zawabi responded swiftly, saying, the soldiers who murdered are the ones who need to apologize. In a statement late last night, Netanyahu said Zawabi crossed all red lines and there is no place for her in the Knesset. In a Facebook post, Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman called Zawabi a terrorist, adding, the IDF will continue to fight against terrorists on the sea, air and land, and that includes terrorists traveling at sea who are members of Knesset, in reference to Zawabi's participation in the 2010 flotilla. Meanwhile, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has for the first time publicly come out against the IHH, the Turkish activist group aboard the 2010 Gaza-bound flotilla, whose members violently attacked Israeli forces on the Mavi Marmara. Speaking last night during an iftar, a Ramadan iftar at his presidential residence, Erdogan blamed the group for causing the diplomatic crisis in the first place. Erdogan said flotilla organizers never asked his permission as prime minister to launch the flotilla. He criticized the IHH for undermining the accord with Israel. Israel, stressing that it was a good development for the Palestinians and was based on a mutual benefit. Earlier this week, the IHH criticized the deal, saying it amounted to an acceptance of the blockade. Erdogan charged that this was not the case, since Turkey has Israel's promise that all aid supplies will be permitted into Gaza. Amots Asael is back in the studio for a glance behind the headlines. Amots, welcome. Hi, Lon. This morning's terrorist attack in Kiryat Alba is one of the more brutal we've seen recently. What sort of repercussions can we expect from this event? I think that we have to look at it uh, from uh, two uh, viewpoints. One is uh, the public, the other is the operational. Operationally speaking, this vicious attack came from the general Hebron area and one can expect now the security forces to um, seize and scan much more thoroughly that entire area because it is being widely understood as a hotbed of particularly uh, vicious terror attacks. Um, on the public plane, the uh, viciousness of this attack uh, will uh, help Israel now take abroad the case that the terror it faces is not driven by nationalism, but by religious fanaticism, the same one that has become now 
the scourge of the entire international community. Do you think the international community is going to let that message sink in or will there still be resistance even after this horrifying attack? Resistance and denialism is always there, but I think that reasonable people begin, and there are clear signs that people are beginning to understand that what we face here is not about nationalism, but about fanaticism. We just saw uh, recently in the, in the segment about Hanin Zawabi, who managed to inflame the entire Knesset again yesterday with her inflammatory remarks. Is this more of the same, or is this the straw that, that is going to break the camel's back? Uh, in terms of her own strategy, it is more of the same. But in terms of the circumstances that make her uh, behave this way, she has an internal political situation within the Israeli Arab political community where she's coming under increasing pressure. And this is how she's trying to grandstand. More broadly speaking, this will obviously make Are it... Are you saying um, she's doing uh, what Israelis would say davka on purpose in order to get political she's points? Trying, she's trying to impress what she understands is her constituency and which experts about Israeli-Arab politics dispute and think that this does not impress quite as many Israeli-Arab voters as she assumes it does, but that remains to be seen. Having spoken this much about the Arabs, I would say about the Jews in the Knesset that this will obviously uh, make it uh, easier and more opportune for them to pass legislation that will, uh, will allow them in the future to suspend or even remove uh, lawmakers. Uh, from right, the, the suspension bill has been on the agenda, but we haven't heard much about it recently. You expect that to make a, a comeback now and this possibly cross the This is the kind of thing that keeps it alive, no doubt. Okay, well, Turkey has been in the headlines this week over both the reconciliation agreement with Israel and the terrorist attack at Istanbul airport. How might these two unrelated events impact Israel's regional position? I think that what we're facing has uh, immense uh, meaning uh, because Israel and Turkey have been, um, since Israel's establishment, uh, potential allies and most frequently actual allies, but also most frequently quiet allies. They became very open allies only after 1992, when many other circumstances here and the fall of the Soviet Union um, made that possible. All this regressed, as we recall, badly in the aftermath of the Islamists' takeover over their last decade. Now that uh, regression has bottomed out, and what we've all seen now is that the fundamental interests that bring Turkey and Israel together in this region as anchors of stability are stronger than these uh, internal Turkish circumstances that drove Turkey momentarily away from Israel. Do you think that there might be a shift in terms of public perception inside Turkey towards warming ties with Israel? Since First we're of all, all the public boat? perception in Turkey has, even in these bad days, not been nearly as bad as some people made it seem. And it will clearly continue improving now. Uh, the question is where Turkey itself is headed, and that is obvi uh, obviously beyond Israel. Uh, both to predict and let alone to shape. Uh, beyond any of us to predict. Uh, sticking with the reconciliation deal, the families, uh, both of the two soldiers whose bodies are being held in Gaza and of the two Israeli civilians who are being held hostage in Gaza, uh, are furious with the Prime Minister for not including their return as part of the deal with Turkey, forcing Turkey to put pressure on Hamas. These are very difficult choices, but has the Prime Minister made the right call here? I think that every Israeli identifies with the cause of, of the families. That goes without saying, and it doesn't even take an Israeli to identify with the cause. However, in terms of the possibilities at play here, one should bear in mind that the Turks were by no means responsible uh, for what happened to them, and the deal with them uh, only indirectly involved Hamas. And the leverage that Israel could manufacture in the wake of this deal concerning this particular part of the broad picture was limited. I therefore don't see how Netanyahu could have... Uh, uh, derived here any any different outcome. Amot, thank you very much. Thank you, Alon. Today is the second day of a UN-sponsored international conference in Geneva focusing on Israeli-Palestinian peace. Organizers said the aim is to bring negotiators and academics together to discuss peace after US-brokered efforts for a two-state solution fell apart in 2014. This current drive is in addition to the French proposals supported by the European Union aimed to bring Israel and the Palestinians back to the negotiating table with the summit towards the end of the year. Speaking at the UN conference yesterday, Palestinian negotiator Nabil Shat insisted the Palestinians have not given up on peace. Without a pivotal role for the United Nations and the international community, peace is not possible. The Palestinian cause will always be Egypt's top priority. That's the latest from Egyptian Foreign Minister Sameh Shoukri, who met yesterday with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas in Ramallah. 
The two discussed the recent French peace initiative, pushing for an Israeli-Palestinian peace deal. Shokri emphasized that Cairo is committed to supporting the rights of the Palestinians to establish an independent state along the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital. In the United Kingdom, the instability of the political fallout of the Brexit vote continues. Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn has refused to resign despite losing a vote of confidence among party uh, MPs and suffering mass resignations from his shadow cabinet. He is expected to face leadership challenge from shadow business secretary Angela, Angela, Angela Eagle. Yesterday, Prime Minister David Cameron, who has pledged to step down, said this. And I have to say to the Honourable Gentleman, he talks about job insecurity and my two months to go. It might be in my party's interest for him to sit there. It's not in the national interest. And I would say, for heaven's sake, man, go. Nominations closed today for the Conservative Party leadership with five candidates in the race. Home Secretary Theresa May is bookmaker's favourite to win. In a shock twist, former London Mayor Boris Johnson scrapped his candidacy announcement at the very last minute after fellow Leave campaigner Michael Gove threw his hat in the ring. In finance, the pound is still down, but the FTSE 100 has bounced back to pre-vote levels and is expected to put in its best monthly performance since October. In other news, school is officially out for the summer. Some one and a half million elementary students and preschoolers today bid farewell to their teachers and hello to the summer vacation. The happy campers joined their high school peers who wrapped up ten days ago for the two-month-long summer vacation. For the third year in a row, the Education Ministry is offering special low-cost camps for first and second graders at schools across the country. Some 200,000 children have already enrolled in the programme. For parents already feeling the anxiety, studies will resume on the 1st of September, a full month before the High Holy Days. And while many pupils are expected to spend their summer staring at a screen, lounging around at home or at the beach, a pioneering group of 7th graders from Jerusalem has a different plan. IBA's Marga Dutkevich met with the inspiring kids and has this report. Kid to Kid is the brainchild of Yedidia Rabinovitz and Eliora Weiss. They began the project two years ago at the age of 10, after hearing of children forced to spend long bouts in hospital, often without any toys to play with. Me and Eliora founded the project Kid to Kid uh, two years ago. Its goal is to donate toys to kids in hospitals and shelters so they'll have something to do with their extra time that they have so they won't become bored. So, and basically we get the toys from kids that don't need them anymore because they get new toys or just they get too old for those toys. And we give them to kids in hospitals that really appreciate them. We donated over 350 toys and we actually have other toys here that we're gonna donate in the upcoming couple of days. If we get broken toys, we, we fix them or we started bringing them to kids in schools so they can be part of helping other kids. And we give them the tools they need and the stuff they need so they can fix them. And then we can bring them in good shape to the kids in the hospitals. In a small air-conditioned room in Catamon, other seventh graders are involved in the Tamid project, initiated by computer whiz kid Natan Goldfarb. They spend their time collecting and repairing old computers, distributing them to families and pupils unable to afford their own. One of my sister uh, works at the army. One day she came home and said that she has a student in the school that she works at that doesn't have money to buy a computer. The youth group Tzedek, there's a youth group for teenagers that mostly Ethiopian, but not only, um, that gave us this room. So we teach them how to fix computers and they work with us on fixing computers and we hope to open a few more branches. Our goal is till December to pass the 2,000 machines given out. Till now we did 450 machines. Alex Sasanetsky, head of the Ginota Ear Community Center in the capital's German colony, and is also in charge of the Youth Initiative and Activism Department. His goal, to persuade youth of all ages to become more involved 
and take responsibility for themselves and their community. In the youth department actually we have two uh, main projects. One of them is the youth department where we work with the uh, youth movements, uh, schools, we do uh, community activities here in our zone of a uh, Ginotai community center. The second main project is the uh, Jerusalem Center for Activism. We are the difference between an idea coming true and not coming true because of the resources, because of the advisement, because of the helping them to make an uh, uh, event, a big one, uh, and help them to be uh, a public uh, a public issue of their uh, project. A child in uh, Pisgat Ze'ev or Gilo can uh, uh, he can came to us with the idea and we will help uh, develop it. Develop, to develop it. While Yadidi and Natan's projects are relatively small, their dream is to make a difference and inspire school pupils across the country to become more involved. Margot Dutkevich, IBA News. Turning to the arts, a musical extravaganza live at the museum is on tap at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Beginning the 11th of July, music lovers will be treated to performances by some of the country's most popular entertainers at the museum's very own Billy Rose Art Garden. Yudi Dravitz hosts Shalom Chanoch in the opening concert, followed by Aviv Geffen and Eviatel Banai. The event will also feature an unprecedented ensemble of seven grand pianos, accompanying many of the country's top performers all on one stage. That's live at the museum at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, 11th through to 14th of July. In finance, the shekel is up against most major currencies and shares are mixed on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. In weather, the weekend will be warm and pleasant. Tomorrow should be partially cloudy with a slight drop in temperatures, which will then rise again slightly on Saturday. That's all for today and for this week. For me and the entire IBA team, it's a good evening and Shabbat Shalom, live from Jerusalem.